Well, good morning and happy new year. So that that uh, happy new year this year just seems to have more meaning, doesn't it? Uh, as we come into 2021 with great anticipation and excitement. Uh, I don't know that that our excitement will be fulfilled or not. I, you just never know what the year is going to hold. But we are here, and we're glad we're here. I uh, want to give you a couple announcements really quick this morning. One, that everything will get back going this week. So Wednesday night, everything will be on schedule for Wednesday night, and then Sunday school will resume next Sunday. And so you'll get some more information in your inbox this week telling you the details and getting you caught up to speed on those things. But we will resume this week, and we're excited about that. Stand with me this morning for our call to worship. There's a lot of things that 2021 holds, uh, just as every year holds. And a lot of things we say, well, what, what should we do? What's fitting to do on a day like this? I can tell you one thing that is absolutely fitting for this day. It's the words of the psalmist in Psalm 147. Praise the Lord. For it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. This is a day that it is absolutely fitting to praise our great God, because this is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice, we're going to be glad in it, we're going to give praises to His great name. Let's sing and let's worship our King today. Jesus came for 
forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed, living he Let's join in prayer together. Father, we are so thankful 
that you are our God. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. Christ is our risen King who reigns forevermore. And in Him we rejoice, and now through Him we come to you, Father, to give you praise and glory. Father, you are the sovereign Lord of all creation. You have each of our days numbered, and you are in control of what goes on, God. Nothing happens without you knowing it. And Father, we pray that our lives would be all for your glory. Father, in our nation, there is turmoil. There is unrest. And Father, the answer to it is not politicians, more legislation, it's not more money, it's none of those things, God. The answer to what our nation needs is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through him and him alone, there is salvation. Father, would you give our nation peace? Would you give our nation rest, God? But let it be because men and women, boys and girls, have placed their faith in the one true and living Savior who died on the cross for our sins and who was raised by your power on that glorious day. Father, we long for our Savior to return. Father, not because the things in this world are so bad, but because our Savior is so glorious and so mighty and so powerful and so wonderful that we want to see Him high and lifted up. Father, we long for the day when we are freed from sin and sickness and sorrow, Father, when we are in your presence. And Father, we thank you for the eternal life that we have in Christ Jesus now. And we long for the fulfillment of our salvation. So Father, we pray that in your time, by your will, come, Lord Jesus. So Father, we pray all of this for your glory and for our good in the name of our risen, returning Savior, Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 24. It says, But concerning that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is God's holy word. Come thou Every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by the name I'm fixed upon it, aim of thy redeeming love. Oh, to grace how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a Feel it for thy glory. 
open your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 13. I just kind of struck that song we just sang, just a phrase, just kind of stood out. Has that ever happened to you where you sing a song numerous times and this morning we sing with all creation, I praise I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Did we sing that with sincerity? That He is our everything? We adore Him. All that we long for, all that we hope for, Christ? Would we sing with sincerity the song that we often sing? It's been a while, I think. Give me Jesus in the morning when I rise, just give me Jesus. In the morning when I rise, just give me Jesus. That's all I want. The day when I die, give me Jesus. Is that the song of our hearts? I hope and I pray that that is who we are, that's who we long for in 2021, that we long for Christ, that he is our everything, that we long for him and he is our greatest desire, our greatest delight, much more than anything or anyone in this world, that we long for him. I want to do a quick survey this morning before the sermon find out how many of you, by a show of hands, are snooze button enthusiasts. Any of you enjoy hitting the snooze button? All right, yep. So the rest of you are these weird creatures that hear the alarm and just get out of bed. I don't like you. I don't get along with you. My wife is one of you. The alarm goes off, and sometimes it doesn't even go off. She has this, like, awareness that it's about to go off, and she just gets out of bed and starts going on with life. And I am not that way. I hear the alarm, and I hit the snooze button, which is fine and well until you think you hit the snooze button and you hit the off button, and that's on a Sunday morning, and you're a pastor. That's bad. So what ensues at that point is your wife shaking you and yelling, wake up, we overslept, you hit the snooze button and turned the alarm off. And of course I am completely confused, I don't know what happened, I don't know what day it is, I don't know why she's yelling in my ear, and finally I realize what's going on, it's time to get to church, this was not this morning by the way, but it's time to get to church, and we have four kids to get ready, and I was already supposed to be there and playing guitar at the time. And it was not a good situation. So we went through the house, get up, wake up, wake up, get dressed. We got to go to church. And so we fly to church, get to here. And then as soon as we walk through the door, you know the routine, right? We come barreling through the door like it's World War III and the world is ending. As soon as the door opens, we all slow down and look nice and just walk in like everything's normal. Well, the Apostle Paul in Romans 13 gives us the same message. Wake up and get dressed. It's time for action. We need to hear that this morning. We need to hear the words of the Apostle Paul. Wake up and get dressed. Because many of us are walking through life asleep. We're walking through as though we are in some kind of slumber, and we need to hear the call to wake up. We need to hear the call of urgency from the Apostle Paul this morning. Let's read Romans 13, 11 through 14. You'll, you'll remember before we read verse 8 through 11 or 8 through 10, you may not remember. We studied that back before Christmas where the Apostle Paul talks about the love that we have for one another being so important that it fulfills the law, that we fulfill the law by loving one another. And all the commands that we are given, if we simply love our neighbor, we will be fulfilling those laws. 
So he comes into verse 11. He says, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now, as we've Walk through Romans, we've noticed that Paul always gives commands based on what God has done. He he does that looking back. The the reality of Christ's work on the cross, his saving work in our life, should compel us and drive us to live for him. So the commands are based on the reality. But he kind of shifts his his focus, his gaze here. Instead of saying, live your life for Christ because of what he's done, in this passage, he says, live your life for Christ because what awaits. So he's looking or bringing us to look forward in anticipation of the fact that Christ will indeed return. So what we see in this passage is we see in verse 11, in the beginning of verse 12, we'll see a a statement of of reality that we are to wake up, and he's followed by three commands that Paul gives us. And so we want to first look at the the reality, the reality to, to wake up. The hour has come for you to awake, Paul says. He talks about time. He says, this you, for this you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. When he talks about time here, the apostle has two kind of purposes, two reasons for talking about time. Here, here's the first one. The first reason is that he wants to give us a, a future awareness. He wants to, to maintain this future awareness of what's going to happen. It's eschatology is the big theological word. He wants to, to generate this eschatological awareness that we would look forward and see what awaits us as the people of God. And so in light of that, we are called to live a certain way. And so he's wanting to to cause us to look forward to the fact that Christ will return. He says, beside this, you know the time. You know the time. That there is something else coming down the road. And so he's referring to the return of Christ. When he says, you know the time, He's referring to and reminding us that we, as God's people, are not unaware of what lies next. We, we can't live unaware of the fact that Christ will return. Why can he say we know the time? Well, because we have been warned. We have been told in the scriptures. Jesus spoke frequently of the time, that we are in the time awaiting his return. He spoke frequently that he would indeed come back. That's what Pastor Mike read in Matthew 24 in the scripture reading. Earlier in that same chapter, Jesus said, For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. He's talking about his return in Mark chapter 13. We, we read this. This is verse, starting verse 32 of Mark 13. He says, but, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the son but only the father so what's he say be on guard stay awake for you do not know when the time will come it is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to keep awake therefore stay awake for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or the midnight when the rooster crows or in the morning lest he comes suddenly and finds you asleep what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. The master will return is the point. You, you may not know when, right? We may not know when Christ will return, but what we do know is that Christ will return. The master will return. He will come back. We are not unaware. We know the time. We know what awaits in Luke 17, verse 28 to 30. He says, just as it was in the days of Lot, They were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. He's saying, listen, I will return. 
And, and it'll be just like in the days of Lot. People will be living in ungodliness. People will be pursuing their own lives and their own desires. They'll be saying, hey, it's no big deal. Let's live however we want to live. This whole thing's a hoax. In that moment, the Son of Man will return. He will return to the surprise of many. The New Testament writers wrote the same thing and gave us the similar warnings. 2 Peter 3.10 Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. There will be an end. There will be a day in which the Lord comes and he returns. Revelation 16, 15 says, behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. James 5 8 says the coming of the Lord is at hand and many of you have studied through Thessalonians in small groups and this passage will ring true to you or familiar to you in 1 Thessalonians 5 1 through 11. Listen to what Paul writes. He says now concerning the times and the seasons brothers you have no need to have anything written to you. Now why not? Why do you think you have no need to have anything written to you? For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and of, for the helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. See, Paul's writing the same thing here as he writes to the, to the believers in Rome. He says, listen, I, I, I'm writing concerning the times and seasons, but You really don't have a need for that. Why? Because you know, you've been told, our Lord told us that he would return. And he would return like a thief in the night. You know that you're not those walking around in darkness. You're not those walking around ignorantly. Listen, people of God, you know that Christ has said he will return. He will come. We're not ignorant of that. We've been informed. We've been told. We've been warned. We've been given a divine heads up. God has tipped his hand. We've read the last chapter. We know how the story ends. We know what awaits. We know that Christ will return. So we do not live unaware. No, we live with an awareness of what will happen in the future. And we must not get lulled asleep by the routines of life. But we must live aware of the return of Christ. The second purpose he has when he talks about time, he says you know the time, is to foster a a, a present urgency, to foster this present sense of urgency in how we live now. Look look there in in verse 11. He says, uh, in the second part of it, he says, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Now, when when he's talking about salvation here, do you notice kind of the dimension or the the tense? It's this future salvation, right? Do you see that here? That salvation in the New Testament is spoken of in three dimensions, past, present, and future. Your, your examples of that you can look at later. Uh, it's spoken of in the past in Ephesians 2.8, where the scripture says, for by grace you have been saved. It's something that has already occurred. You've been saved. It's spoken of in the present in 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 
And later in Romans 5, 9, it's spoken of in the future. Therefore, since we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him, by the power of God. So we see salvation referred to as something that happens in the past, something that's ongoing, something that will happen in the future. And here, Paul is looking forward to the ultimate salvation that will come when Christ returns. Why? Because he's wanting to create and give us this sense of urgency. How do we see that? We see that in the, the, the terms that he uses here. Just think, look, at, look at what he says. He says, you know the time, right? The time that the hour has come. And it's come for what? For you to wake up. You don't have all day. You can't just stay sleeping. It's time to get up and go. Salvation is what? Nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. You know the feeling when you lay down at night, and you, you, you lay down to sleep and, and, and rest. You think, I have the whole night. It's no big deal. But then when you wake up, if you wake up at, say, what, 6.30 or so, and you know, man, it's about to be daybreak. It's about time to go. There's a sense of urgency that Paul is giving us here. Just a statement that salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. That should give us some urgency to know that every day we live is a day closer to the return of Christ. It's a day closer to the moment in which we stand before our maker. Now some of you are rightfully smiling right now. Some of you are warmed by that thought. You think, wow, there is a day, it is getting closer and closer that I'm going to stand before my maker. That the, the, the things that ail me now, the things that weigh me down, the sin I struggle with will be cast away, it will be gone, and I'll be standing before Christ. And that warms my heart. But not everybody's smiling. And rightfully so. Because if, if you're not one of God's people, if you've not been redeemed by Christ, if you're not reconciled to Him, a child of God, then that is not a good day. But that day is coming. And you need to know that there will be a day in which you stand before your Maker, ready or not. And on that day, there's no second chances. There's no, well, I was pretty much a Christian, or well, I, I went to church, I was a pretty good guy. No. There's a clear line on that day. You either are a Christian or you're not. And it's not by what you do or who you are or, or what you know. It's all based on the blood of Christ. And if you've repented and trusted in him, that's the only thing that saves that day is Christ. That day will come. And so that should give us a sense of urgency in the way we live. It should give us a sense of gospel urgency in that I want to tell people about Christ. It should give me a sense of urgency in the, the way I live and the way I pursue holiness that I want to live for Him. I want to glorify Him because the days to do so are shorter now than they were when I was 18. You know how quickly time goes. And it's moving progressively every day closer to the day in which we stand before our Maker. Now Paul is not in the business here predicting a day. He's not saying, you know what, on March the 18th, Jesus is going to return at 7 a.m. That, that's not what he's doing. When he says in verse 12, the night is far gone, the day is at hand, he's not saying, hey, listen, this is it. This is the day. Jesus is coming back today. I know it. No, because it's very clear in Scripture that nobody knows the day that is happening. No one knows the time in which it is happening. We just know that it will happen indeed. It will come. So when, when he says that the day is at hand, or your, your translation could mean, or it could say the day is imminent, it's, it's not a calendar term. He's not saying that, that Jesus is going to come back on this date. That's why we don't concern ourselves with saying it's coming back on this date. No, we concern ourselves with the fact that Christ will indeed return, and we look forward to that day. We realize that his return is imminent in that it is the next thing along God's timeline of redemption. So that if you lay it all out on a timeline and you start and you say, here's creation. And you just work through all that he's done in his plan of redemption. And you work up and you see we just celebrated the incarnation, the, the time when God took on flesh and came as a man. And he came and he lived a perfect life and he died the death on the cross in our place. And he rose from the grave three days later and then he ascended into heaven and he reigns supreme at the right hand of the Father. 
when those events occurred, there is nothing else on that timeline. You can see thing after thing after thing after thing after thing in God's redemptive plan. Those are the last things in God's redemptive plan before the return of Christ. There's nothing else that we look forward to. It is the return of Christ is next. That is imminent. It's what awaits. And so it should create this sense of urgency in our lives. It's just like when you, you play musical chairs. You, you remember playing musical chairs, right? You have 10 of you and some creative person has only put nine chairs in the circle. And then they play a song that is just usually an awful cheesy song that you don't like anyway. And they hit the play and you start walking around. And what happens? The longer it plays, what happens? You just don't even care, do you? No, that's not right. The longer it plays, you, get, you start kind of jumping to the next chair, and then you want to stay at that chair as long as you, until you have to move to the next one, and you're trying to anticipate when it stops. And when it stops, everybody goes for a chair. It's the same thing, that the music's playing. We know what awaits. The only thing that awaits in that moment in musical chairs is that the music stops. And we know that right now the music's playing. The only thing that awaits is the return of Christ. We know the time. We need to live in light of that time, and we need to live with a sense of urgency because that time is coming. We need to wake up. We need to wake from sleep. I think the problem is a lot of us are walking around as though we're asleep. We're walking around as though we're, we're in this deep slumber. We have all the time in the world. That it's the beginning of night, yet Paul says, night is far gone. The day is at hand, he says. But, but many of us have been rocked to sleep, so to speak. We, we've been rocked to sleep because we're so caught up in our, our hobbies and our entertainment and watching our kids grow up and experiencing the success of our good business life that we've just fallen asleep. And all we're worried about is those things. We're worried about being a good student, getting good grades, being a successful athlete, being liked, getting likes, having people retweet or share what we post. And all the time, God's Word is saying, wake up, wake up. The day is at hand, it is time to wake up. We've been given the gift of time. And we need to make the most of it. We need to redeem it. Paul says in Ephesians 5.15, he says, Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. We have to redeem the time. We need to cash it in. We need to make the most of what we have. It is indeed the most valuable asset we have. It's far more valuable than money. It's far more valuable than any skill you have. Because your time is precious. And what you spend it on, you can't get it back. You have a set amount of it. I have a set amount of it. What am I going to do with it? What am I going to do with it? Jonathan Edwards, in his resolutions, he, he wrote this. One of his resolutions was, I resolve never to lose one moment of time, but to improve it in the most profitable way I possibly can. Salvation is nearer today than it was yesterday. When we wake up tomorrow morning, it'll be nearer to the return of the Lord, whether that's Him returning or us standing before Him because we've passed from this life. It's nearer every day. What would it mean for us to approach the time we have the way Edwards did, where we said, you know what, I resolve never to lose one moment of time. But, but I'm going to improve it in the most profitable way I possibly can. I'm going to use it. I'm going to leverage it. I'm going to make the most of it. I'm going to redeem it. I'm going to cash it in for the glory of God, for the advancement of the gospel. I'm not going to lose the time sitting around having a pity party over the situations of life. We're all there. We're all in the same situation. And God's called us to redeem the time that he's given us. God's called us to live this moment for his glory. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to go right into 2021 
and not be worried about what's it going to look like. Is it going to be better or worse in 2020? I don't know. What I do know is that I'm called to redeem the time. What I do know is that salvation is nearer today than it was yesterday. What I do know is that my God reigns and he rules and he is supreme. And I'm going to serve him regardless of what 2021 looks like. And so that's what we're called to do. We're called to wake up and have some urgency about the task at hand. Wake up and live our lives for the glory of God. What does that look like? Paul gives us three commands here. You see, he gives us commands because when he states this theological reality, this truth that, you know what, time is of the essence, it is time to wake up because you know the hour is at hand, salvation is nearer to you today than it was yesterday, those truths, that reality, that is not meant to sit on the shelf and look at and goes, wow, that's really neat. Isn't that nice? That's some good theology. Jesus will return. We believe that. No, theological truth is not designed and given just to set up and look pretty. It's given that we might live for God's glory, that we might apply it to our lives today. And so that's what Paul does. He says, listen, in light of that, there's three things you need to do. Here's the first one. He says in verse 12, second part of verse 12, he says, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. If you're familiar with scripture, you, you understand that when he says darkness and light, he's, he's contrasting sin and holiness or what is worldly and godly. So that, so that what is dark would be worldly, what is, what is dark would be sinful, what is light would be godly, what is light would be holy. He says put off those things that are unholy, those things that are of the world, and put on the things that are godly, the things that are holy. You can jot this down and look later. This is a pretty common terminology for Paul to say put off and put on or cast off and put on. You can see that also in Colossians 3, 5 to 17, where Paul talks about putting to death sin that is raging in you and putting on godliness. Or you can look in Ephesians 4, 17 to 32, where he does the same thing. He, he calls us to put off ungodliness and put on godliness, the things of the Lord. You can think of it as kind of this replacement principle it's been called, that, that we're called to get rid of the deeds of the flesh. We're called to get rid of sinfulness. We're called to get rid of ungodliness, but not just get rid of it, but we're called to replace it with something else, replace it with godliness, put on godliness. The, the thing that where a lot of us stumble is this, is where, where we put off something, but we never put anything else back on. We, we get rid of something, and, and it, it leaves this void. And we don't intentionally go, okay, I've gotten rid of this sin. Now I'm going to pursue God in this area. And so we think we just get rid of it. Well, what happens? It just comes back in. It comes back in. It's just like at the beach when you, you dig a hole. You get all the water out. What happens? It just comes right back in. I've got to replace it with something. Put something else in there to prevent that from happening. And Paul says, put off and put on. It's what he said in Revel or 1 Thessalonians 5.8. Did you catch it? See, this terminology of Paul is all throughout his writings. In 5.8, in 1 Thessalonians, he said, But since we belong to the day, talking about us being awake, since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So he's saying the same thing. We are to put on the things of God. So cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light, he says. That's the first thing. The second thing he tells us to do is in verse 13. He says, let us walk properly as in the daytime. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. So we know that the Lord is returning. We know that that day is closer today than it was yesterday. So we need to walk properly as in the daytime. He's simply saying to live a godly life. When we see that in Scripture, walk a walk with the Lord, a walk that is in honor of the Lord, a walk that, um, that exemplifies godliness, that shows that we are Christian. He's simply meaning that the way we live would be godly. If we're going to live godly, what does it mean? It means we have to renounce ungodliness. It means we get rid of those things that would prevent us from pursuing a righteous life. It means that we have a concern for personal holiness. It means that, that I have a concern when I wake up and go about my day, what is going to help me live a life that is godly, that is honoring to him? What, what is your 
desire and commitment to personal holiness in 2021? Do, do you have a desire for that? Is that something you've thought through? Is that something you long for? Is that something you say, you know what, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I want to grow in godliness in 2021. I want to pursue holiness. I want to pursue the things of the Lord. Well, Paul gives us three things here, three groupings of sin that we need to flee from, that we need to mortify, that we need to kill, that we need to avoid if we're going to pursue godliness. Look what he says. He, he said to let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual, sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Kind of three groupings of specific sins that he calls out. The, these three groupings, they're all very closely tied. You see much overlap. But we need to think specifically about them for a moment because I think they're challenges that we face. Very real challenges that some are wrestling with today. Perhaps some of you sitting in here wrestling with. The, the first thing he says, he calls us away from what? Orgies and drunkenness. That, that word orgies was a term in that time that simply described these, these parties that went late into the night in which everybody was drinking and getting drunk and they would walk down the streets loud and, and playing music and just being loud and disturbing everyone with torches going through the night. And these, these parties were characterized by drunkenness and just, just all out. Everything goes. So the first thing he says, he says, don't get involved in orgies and drunkenness. Don't get involved in these things. Don't abuse alcohol, essentially. The second grouping, he says what? He says, let us cast off or, or get away or flee from sexual immorality and sensuality. Sexual immorality, this unrestrained lust and immorality. It, man, this characterizes our society. A, a society, a culture that is so enamored with sexuality, is so enamored with the physical world, that it is everywhere in front of us. And Paul calls us away from that. He says, get rid of that. Cast it off. Cast off those things like adultery. Cast away pornography. Cast away sex outside of marriage. Cast away homosexuality. Get rid of it all. Pursue biblical sexuality. Stand for what God's good design is. And don't get caught up in the sinfulness of sexual immorality and sensuality. And then third, he spells out quarreling and jealousy. Boy, we see that, don't we? Don't we see so much quarreling online where, where you have these social media watchdogs who if the wrong thing is posted, the wrong word is used, someone pounces on them from their view, and it's on both sides. Whatever my view is, I'm ready, and if somebody says the wrong thing, man, I am on them. And the quarrel ensues. We are ready to quarrel in our day. We're so poised and ready to attack and ready to argue and ready to debate. And he says, put aside quarreling, jealousy, wanting what everybody else has, wanting everybody to see me. Put aside quarreling and jealousy. I'm not saying there is never a time to stand. There's never a time to debate. There's never a time to call out wrong and right. But if we have a spirit of quarreling that we just or bent towards wanting to quarrel with others and, and debate and argue for the sake of arguing, then we need to check ourselves and ask, is that what it looks like to walk in the light? Is that what it looks like to live for Christ? So flee from those things. Flee from them. Because none of them do what Paul had just spoke of, uh, spoke of in verses 8 through 10. None of those are characterized by love for others. Are they? I mean, just, just think about that for a minute. Orgies, drunkenness, sexual immorality, sensuality, quarreling, jealousy, it is all focused on who? Me. Every one of them are selfish. None of them are driven by a love for God or a love for others. They're all driven out of selfishness. The third thing that Paul tells us is in verse 14. He says, put on the Lord 
Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. When, when he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's more than me just saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, and then living however I want to. No, it is, it is referring to saying, I am a Christian, and I habitually identify with him because I live in fellowship with him. I live in union with Christ. All that I am is about Christ. I am a disciple of Christ. I am a follower of Christ. I am a little Christian. He is my master. He is my Lord. I am pursuing him. He is my everything, and I adore him. That's just who I am. It's not this flippant Bible belt, I'm a Christian because I go to church, and I'm going to live however I want to through the week. No, it is the fact that I am a Christian. I am clothed in Christ. I put him on. It's what marks me. It's what identifies me as being a Christian, that I'm clothed with him. It's just like when we were in Wisconsin last week. You knew it was cold. You know how you knew it was cold? Because any time the door opened, we had winter jackets on and hats and gloves. You didn't just walk out in your shorts. You got dressed. You put it on. And so people knew when they looked that it was cold. We clothe ourselves with Christ. We understand that it is Christ who clothes us and warms us from the cold loneliness and guilt of sin. It is Christ who clothes us from the guilt and nakedness of sin. It is Christ who is our armor and protects us from the enemy's attacks. It is Christ who clothes us so much that he identifies who we are and our purpose in life. That we're so clothed with him that people look and they see how we live. They see that we're clothed in Christ and they know what we're about. We understand that. That makes sense to us, right? Because when I look and I see somebody walk in to the coffee shop in a three-piece suit, I look and say, they're, they're a businessman. I see somebody walk in in scrubs. Hey, they're in the medical profession. I see somebody in a truck get out and they've got stirrups on. I know they work with livestock and horses. I see someone walk onto a big green field with pads and a helmet, numbers on their back. And I know they're a football player. See, we see what people are clothed in. We understand what they're about. The question is, are we so clothed with Christ that people know what we're about? Are we so clothed with his love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control that people look and they see those things oozing out of us and they go, that person is a Christian. We are to put on Christ. We are to clothe ourselves with Christ. And he says, make no provision for the flesh. Now, what does that mean? Make no provision for the flesh. That, That simply means that we do not give sin any opportunity to wreak havoc in our lives. We, we make no opportunity for sin to destroy us. That, that means we don't mess around with it. We don't dabble in it. We don't plan for it and say, well, you know what, tomorrow I'll do this. It's not a big deal. Or I'll do this today. I'll change tomorrow. I, I'll, I'll start reading Scripture tomorrow. I'm just going to hang here for now. It means that we don't invite it in. We don't set it up to where, you know what, I know that if this is here, I'm going to stumble, so I'm going to put it there. That's not smart. It means that that we're not ignorant of it. To be ignorant, to choose ignorance over sin is to make provision for it. I I don't remain ignorant and go, hey, it's not there. Yes, it is there. We battle with it. it. It means that I don't pretend that it won't destroy me. It means that I don't live in this fantasy world that I'm so holy that I can't be undermined and destroyed by sin. It means that I live on guard and don't make provision for the flesh. Listen, I I would just ask, are you making provision for sin in your life? Or are you planning and striving for holiness? Make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision for sin. These are important words from God's Word this morning. They're so important. Why? Because the reality is we do sit 
in the midst of a time where we are weary. We, we sit in the midst of a time where the depression, the loneliness, the stress, the isolation of what we've gone through and we're still in the midst of has led people to numb all of those feelings with substance abuse. Whether that's some type of medication or drug, whether it's alcohol, there are people, perhaps some sitting in here or watching on TV, who would say, you know what, I, I, I just want to forget this. I want to put it aside. I want to be numb to it. I don't want to have to worry about it. I want to drink myself to sleep. And they're depending on that. Drunkenness, what Paul calls us away from. These words are important to wake up from that. Wake up. The day is at hand. There's urgency about our task. Walk away from that. Make no provision for the flesh in those areas. Pursue Christ. These words are important because we live in a day in which the, the attack on our purity, on our eyes, on our mind, on our understanding of biblical sexuality is attacked every day. And so again, the isolation, the loneliness, sitting at home all day studying and doing school with a computer in front of you lends all kinds of opportunities. All kinds of temptations lie every time you pull your phone out to click on something. Sexual immorality is around every turn. There's a tax upon your purity, upon your mind, everywhere you look, shows you watch, things you read. Sites that pop up, sites you visit. We need to flee from those things. We need to cast them off. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. Salvation is nearer today than it was yesterday. It is time for us to pursue holiness. It is time for us to pursue God. It is time for us to be gospel people, intentional about spreading the gospel, speaking the gospel. It is not a time to walk about slumbering, asleep, with our mouths shut. It's time for us to wake up. And when ungodliness comes into our life, and we are so consumed by the threats and dangers of pornography, we're so consumed by drunkenness and trying to numb everything else, or we're so consumed with quarreling, that we think about all those things and we think about how mad we are about this and I can't believe they think that. And we get derailed and we think about those things and we look to those things instead of the things of the Lord. Friends, we cannot remain there. We cannot remain asleep. We must wake up. We must have gospel urgency. The day is far gone. Christ has come. He has died. He has risen. He has ascended. And all that remains is that He will return. It is time to wake up and pursue Him with all that we are and to genuinely live and sing that He is our everything. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you in worship and adoration. Because God, you are God alone. And God, as your people, we have been warned, we have been told, we have been given a divine heads up by you. We know how the story ends, that you will return for your people. And that's all that remains. And so God, I pray that we would live in light of that. That we would not live as though we know not what awaits. But that God, we would live with a sense of urgency, knowing that every day is a day closer to the moment that we spend standing before you. That will be a glorious day, Lord. But God, until that day, I just pray that we as individuals, that we as a church would be those who are consumed with a longing and a desire to glorify you, to pursue personal holiness, God, to make you known, to tell people about you. 
to show your love, to care for people. So God, I pray that we would live in that manner with a sense of urgency for your great name, the name of Christ, our Savior, our Lord. Amen. You know, the reality is that Scripture deals pretty clearly with our sin. And I think that's what Paul does here. The reality is that we fall into those sins. And if not those, there's a plethora of others, right? We should all be shaking our heads right now <laughs> because we do. But in light of that, there's a greater reality that his mercy is new every day. And we rest in that. And so we're going to stand and we're going to sing. We're going to make this our prayer today. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy. We're going to rest in his mercy as we seek to live for him in this year that awaits. Let's stand and let's sing.
ask you to do one thing, and I mean this. If you are one who struggles with any of the things we talked about or just anything in general, and, and you would say, I'm having a hard time putting that away. I just need help. I need someone to come alongside. That's why you have pastors. It's not for us to stand up in front of you and look pretty. We don't do a very good job of that. It's so that we can come alongside you and help you and shepherd you, pray for you, encourage you. And so your homework, if you're stumbling in those areas or any other area, is to grab one of us out here or text one of us or come by and see one of us this week. And say, would you please help me? Come alongside me. I want to put this away. And I want to put on Christ in 2021. I want to pursue him. And I live for him because I know the day is coming. I'm fully aware. And I want to live for him. So would you please do that? I want to leave you with the words, the final chapter of the Bible. Revelation 22, if you read that later, there's three times in there that Jesus says, I am coming, I am coming, I am coming. Verse 20 says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. God bless you and have a great Sunday.